The name of the book is Supercharged Self-Healing. R.J. Spina with us. We're going to take calls with him when we come back. Questions and your own stories next on Coast to Coast AM. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. R.J. Spina with us and your calls this hour. R.J., where do people get your book, Supercharged Self-Healing? Uh, just go to Amazon.com. You get the paperback, the Kindle, or the audiobook. What is a block that will not allow people to use these techniques? Belief. Really? Yes. Doubt? So, or Is that the same as doubt? Uh, I mean, any sort of mental machination is really going to take you away from your own higher consciousness. Thinking is low frequency. And what we are are supremely high-frequency beings. So that's why I say the ego mind identity is a limitation program that runs by thinking. There is no healing in thinking. There's no healing in, in believing. That's spiritual fiction. That's not actually how metaphysics work. So if, if we're not willing to, to challenge our beliefs, then essentially we're the warden of our own prison. How did you have this ability as even a youngster? How did that happen? I, I would just say it's just part of what I am. It's uh, I, I don't really say who, because it really isn't a who, where we are formless, free, and unconditioned, which is what we really are. We are we are sentience. We're a fractal of God. And so this is just the role I play when I incarnate. That, that's all. This just happens to be something that I wanted to experience for myself. I wanted to be here for the helping of the raising of the frequency of humanity. And the way that I can do it is to teach people in terms of self-healing and self-realization and give them a, a tangible experience of what that's like and to give them a step-by-step -step process so they can do it themselves. And again, meditation is critical to this, isn't it? it it's everything. It's absolutely everything. There's countless, countless studies that meditation literally changes your DNA. It repairs cells. There's, there's endless MRIs of, of a monk's brains that look completely different when they use meditation. So, George, it only stands to reason that deeper, more powerful states of meditation only greatly enhance the efficacy of self-healing by an order of magnitude. In that case, give us your definition of what is meditation. What we really are is meditation. It's what exists prior to thought. It is the direct fractal of God. It is love and wisdom. And the subsets beneath love and wisdom are our talents and abilities. It's what we actually are. The self is meditation. And it's not, of course, uh, kumbaya or anything like that, is it? No, those are, George, those are permission slips to try to get yourself into an altered state of consciousness. Yes. And, and these, things, these things have limited efficacy in them, just like crystals and, and uh, you know, sound bowls. And they're, they're helpful, but they're all, they're all limited in their efficacy. You want to work directly with what you really are, which is an, an unlimited fractal of God, and then there really are no limitations. Let's go to the phones. Let's go to first-time caller Joan in Farmington Hills, Michigan. Joanne, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you so much, George. How are you? I'm and good. how are you, RJ? And before you start, Joanne, I used to live in Farmington Hills at 13 Mile and Middle Belt. I'm not too far from there. I'm 12 Mile and Middle Belt. Oh, beautiful area there, but go ahead. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Um, I was listening to RJ, and he was talking about uh, the ability to kind of to detach uh, from whatever, you know, kind of ails us. And I'm wondering if I've made a mistake at accepting this debilitating back pain as just my cross to bear. Now, I've been meditating ever since the 70s, but now the pain keeps me from being able to meditate. I had surgery uh, several years ago, and they shaved that disc down, and then within two months, the one underneath it ruptured. And now I have the rupture and two bulges, L3, L4, and L5. I've been on the same medication, same dosage for the past eight years. So, you know, that's no longer effective. But it's gotten far worse now, and I'm not really liking the way that I'm beginning to think. I don't want to 
continue to be in this much pain all the time. And um, I am also a, a spiritual advisor, or you could say a psychic. I have a very, very large clientele. And the only time that I'm not aware of the pain is when I'm actually reading or in a session with one of my clients. Hmm. So am I not going deep enough? Uh, the pain is just immense because that Ambassador Bridge is starting to look pretty good. But I'd also like to know don't, if— Don't you do it, Joanne. I need my listeners. Pardon? I need my listeners. Don't think about the Ambassador Bridge. Oh, I know, George, but sometimes it's so bad because I can't do anything. I can't clean my house. Um, when uh, uh, on a daily basis, I'm in bed the majority of the time, and then if it's time for me to go somewhere, I have to get up, and it has to be a continuous motion. I can't stop and drink a cup of coffee or any of that. I have to keep moving because the medication is going to wear off in about an hour, hour and a half. And I also wanted to know if having these bulges in my lower spine does that disrupt the flow of kundalini? All right, go ahead, RJ. What can you do for Joel? Okay, well, first off, I'm, I'm sorry that you're suffering. And I totally understand agonizing pain. I've, I've been there. I, I totally get it. I'm very sorry. But there, there is relief. So what you did discover is that when you're completely engaged in something other than yourself, you're not in pain. And I think you need to explore that much further. When you're working with other people, when you're making something the priority other than yourself, all of a sudden the pain is not there. This is a profound epiphany that you've discovered. And I think you need to keep going in that direction. Understand that pain and pleasure are just bodily sensations and you're not the body. And you leave your body behind when you become completely engaged and engulfed in something other than yourself. So whatever it is that you do when you're working with someone, when you're doing a spiritual practice, it's what working. you're really doing is you're, you're offering your own love and wisdom and compassion. That's the self. So when you reside as the self, you leave behind the identification with the body, and lo and behold, you don't feel the pain. Now, how does how does she get into that mode all the time? The, what, whatever that she whatever she does, and everyone's got their own you know way of doing it, so to speak. Whatever she does to get herself to be able to help other people, because she said when she helps other people, it goes away. It, it exactly. So be, because she's no longer obsessed with the self, the ego mind identity has been put aside. And as we said earlier, George, this is so important to understand. The foundation of the ego mind identity is identification with the body, and therefore we become obsessed with pain pleasure. It becomes everything. We, we're constantly seeking pleasure, and we do anything to avoid pain. But when you leave behind the egoic identity and you're in, you're in service to something greater than yourself by helping other people, you no longer identify with the body. And look what happens, the miracle. There's no more pain. So this... This is the key. This is why I talk about in the beginning of the book to transcend the ego mind identity. And she's doing it. Maybe not. she's not totally consciously aware of what she's doing, maybe metaphysically speaking. But she's doing it when she works with other people. And as soon as she does it, she doesn't feel any pain. The self is the key. Identification with the body and obsession with pain and pleasure. As soon as you give something energy, which is attention, attention is energy. As soon as you give something attention and energy, it grows. So as soon as you make a big deal out of your pain, it doesn't go away. It increases. And so I had to teach myself all these things in agonizing, excruciating pain. So the more that you detach and you focus on something outside of your body, it literally, the pain, and she discovered this herself, the pain just literally disappears. I want to go back to Joanne to see if she has a follow-up question. Anything else, Joanne? Well, yes. Well, in, in terms of doing the readings for my clients, it's like in a trance state. And how, how do I stay in a trance state all the time? And the other question was, with these bulges uh, in my lower spine, does it disrupt the flow of kundalini? Okay, so the, the trance state is our natural state. 
So utilizing your higher consciousness, obviously you're not using your five physical senses when you're in a trance state. You're using your higher consciousness. You're using to on what you really are. So when, when people say it's because they don't have a frame of reference, how am I supposed to stay like that all the time? It's actually our natural state. It's actually much easier to stay that way than it is to pretend that we're human. So I know that we think that we have to think about everything, but that's just a thought. We don't have to think about things. Our entire life is memorized. So I really want you to realize this. Our entire life is memorized. We see a chair, we know how to sit. We see a glass, we know how to drink from it. We know how to drive our car. We know how to get to work, wash ourselves, clean ourselves. There's nothing to think about. And it's, already been, it's already been memorized. Stay in that trance state and watch what happens with your life. Watch what happens with your pain. And, and watch what happens in terms of kundalini. Don't worry about injuries to your spine that stops kundalini. My spine was destroyed. And actually by working with myself in the way that I'm talking about right now, we put it back together that nothing is going to stop kundalini except if you give up on it. Good point. Thanks, Joanne. You keep in touch with us. We want to hear from you often on re our regular shows. Eric, truck driving in Indiana. Hello, Eric. Go ahead. Hello, George. I just want to wish you and the guy on here, uh, both of you guys, uh, happy Thanksgiving. You and too, you Eric. And, your family. and we're going to be All live right. on Thanksgiving, so join us that night, okay? Yeah, we'll try to. Uh, I won't be working, so uh, I, I, I I usually, I'm usually in bed. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, I got a question, uh, and I hope it's, uh, it might be a stupid question, but it's never stupid till you ask it, right? Um, what would a person do, and how would he handle it uh, if a person is mentally ill to try to, you know, uh, uh, cure their self? Could they do that? It, it just depends, yes, but you, you can cure yourself from mental illness. It depends what type of mental illness. So uh, I'm going to say something rather, rather controversial. If someone is suffering from bipolarism or schizophrenia, it is my understanding that that's an issue of multiple souls occupying the same physical vehicle, and there's not one soul that has agreed to drive the bus the whole time. And so this, this becomes a little more problematic, but that too can be, can be resolved. But tremendous mood swings, if people have tremendous mood swings and they're associating that with mental illness or schizophrenia or bipolarism, that's actually more than one soul occupying the physical vehicle. It's like driving a car. You have one driver, and there's a couple of people in the back seat, and they're supposed to just sit there and enjoy the ride. But if they get a little too excited and a little too carried away, sometimes they want to reach in front and grab the wheel and try to drive on their own. That's really what schizophrenia and bipolarism, as well as tremendous mood swings. Now, one, one way that we can sort of overcome this is to directly connect with our higher self, which is we are an aspect of our higher self. And the book teaches you how to do this in meditation. And then you literally make sure that the one that was supposed to be driving the bus, that has been agreed to once again. And you remind the higher self that the incarnation is not going to work out the way it was intended if the people in the back seat keep trying to try to uh, grab the wheel and drive the bus for the incarnation. Good point. Text and tweets. Tom, what do you have for RJ? This one is from Patrice in Salt Lake City. I've tried and tried, but I can't seem to reach my higher state of consciousness. Please ask the guest, how do I figure out what I'm doing wrong? Well, that's an interesting question, RJ. Okay, yeah. So the, the answer is going to be funny. Stop trying. So really, it's a surrender. Okay, uh, human beings are always trying. They're using their energy in an, in an outward-focused direction. Meditation is the opposite. You're not using your energy in an outward-focused direction. By doing nothing, and that includes not thinking, you naturally raise in vibration and frequency, and your higher consciousness simply opens up like a flower just simply blooms. It, you don't have to try to do it. It's what you are. You are higher consciousness. So I would say, again, as funny as it sounds, stop trying and literally just surrender into the now so completely that you lose identification with being human. You lose identification with the body. And what will happen is you will naturally, without trying, just as I used to do as a little kid, I didn't know what I was doing, or maybe I really did. 
you will naturally just raise in frequency and your higher consciousness will simply keep opening and spreading just like water keeps flowing. But as soon as you put something in the way, it stops. Well, don't put anything in the way. Let your consciousness continue to flow and you're, you will unveil just like a flower just opens up and blooms. Let's go to Deborah, Long Island, New York. Hi, Deborah. Thanks for calling. Yes, George, you have a fantastic forum, a fantastic show. Thanks. RJ, um, I have a question for you uh, to get to the point, be direct. Um, my question is this. I have to make a decision uh, whether to stay in the apartment I'm in now or move to another apartment You know, within the same community I live in. But I'm having a very difficult decision, and I don't know how to make the decision. Like the other landlord is a little difficult, and the new uh, prospect of, of a new apartment that I'm thinking about moving to, or if I stay here. You know, I have some issues here, you know, with the building. So I don't know how to form, a, you know, a decision about this. And I keep on going back and forth, back and forth, and it's very frustrating. So I need some pointers on how to, you know, make the right decision. Sure. Okay, so I, I want you to ask yourself, what is it that you're trying to achieve? And then that would be moving to a better spot. Are there specifics in terms of what it is that you're trying to achieve? So in other words, I'm trying to achieve a place that's quieter. I'm trying to achieve a place that's less expensive. I'm trying to achieve, you know, so we need to know specifically what it is that we're trying to achieve. And once we have identified specifically what it is that we're trying to achieve, the right decision becomes clearer. And can you have many aspects of that? Like, like you just said, you rattled off three or four things. Can she be wanting to achieve all of those? There needs to be some form of hierarchy in terms of what is most important. Positioning it? Yeah, go ahead. Like positioning it? One, two, three, four, five? Yeah, literally. I mean, it's how we it's how we organize our day, right? There's a hierarchy of things that are most important, and if we get to the things at the end, great. If not, no biggie. So there needs to be some sort of hierarchy in terms of specifically what it is that we're trying to achieve. So if you can name those top three things, or top five things, or top two things, whatever they are, once you have identified them, it'll be much easier for you to make a decision. Interesting. And now, you know what? You can use that technique in just about anything we do in life. Yeah, that, George, this is exactly what we're talking about. These understandings in the book are revolutionary because they're all higher consciousness. Everything is born through a higher consciousness understanding. And we're, what we're doing is we're transcending the thinking mind. And all knowingness is, is the higher consciousness. The thinking mind doesn't know anything. That's why it constantly wants more and more information, because it doesn't authentically know anything. The higher consciousness does know. So we just simply have to go to the higher consciousness and utilize that. And one way to do it is to simply always ask yourself, what is it specifically that I'm trying to achieve? We're going to come back in just a moment with R.J. Spina and take final phone calls. His book is called Supercharged Self-Healing. His website, AscendTheFrequencies.com, linked up for you at CoastToCoastAM.com. Just uh, great techniques to uh, really change your life. So we will be back in a moment with your calls on Coast to Coast AM. On our next Coast to Coast program, we're going to talk about how technology can be used to control the population. Make sure you're part of the program. And then later on, witches and warlocks of Massachusetts. And welcome back to Coast to Coast, our final segment with R.J. Spina. R.J., what are you working on next? What are your next projects? Uh, I'm going to be coming out with an online course and a mobile app that uh, teaches the Ascend the Frequencies healing technique that's captured in the book. And I'm going to be including things that the publisher would not publish that were just simply too controversial. That's a great idea, by the way, the, the app. That could be very, very exciting for a lot of people. Yeah, they're, they're going to have everything that they need for self-healing and self-actualization in their hand. And instead of using our phone to endlessly distract ourselves with the low-frequency low activities, we're now going to be able to access the phone and use it to liberate ourselves, literally. What do you think we are as human beings? I mean, why were we created? Hum- the, the, a human being is, is an experiment. And it's, it's the experiment in individualized free will. And so it was decided, uh, we'll say a long time ago, even though time doesn't really exist, it was decided a long time ago that 
giving each temporarily individualized unit of consciousness the ability to evolve in its own way and in, and in its own time, the idea is that consciousness will be able to evolve in a much more rapid fashion. And so that's really the idea behind a human being. It's, it's the individualized free will project. That's what a human being is. It's an experiment mm-hmm. in, in the evolution of consciousness itself. And what I like about these techniques you've been pointing out tonight, it, even though health is critically important, it's able to be used for all kinds of things to get by as a human being. Yeah, George, the truth is the truth. It should be applicable all the time. And that's the thing about uh, spirituality. People think spirituality is what you do, like, oh, for now, for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to shut my door and put on my meditation music and light my incense and meditate. And then the rest of the day, we go back to the ego mind identity. It, it should be the opposite. The opposite. And true, authentic spirituality should be applied and useful for every single moment of our existence. Let's go back to the phones east of the Rockies. Joe, Long Island, New York. Hello, Joseph. Yeah, first I want to say that uh, yo, yo, the lady that had the bulging disc. Joanne. Liter- yeah. yeah, the literature says high doses of vitamin C will repair that in many cases. But I have a three-part question on the meditation for RJ and had an opinion on the pyramid. Uh, first, like, your particular thing, okay, as you were meditating, I mean, your situation was very much in your face. Now, how would you say when you meditate now, say you had a broken tooth or a broken finger or some hair loss and you wanted to meditate on that, that's not really that dire. Do you see a difference with that? The second part, can you meditate for someone else with, with a similar situation? And the third part is, say you wanted to do something new, like paint a picture, and you had never done that before in your lifetime, uh, as one example. That would be the, my question on the meditation. And my opinion on the pyramids is, I think those stones were gathered and put together by people that were doing something like meditation, directed consciousness, and that was a lost art, and it was built uh, similar to the Coral Castle guy. I think that's how that happened, but that's Lead skull. just an opinion. <laughs> okay, and tell us again your first question, Joe. Yeah, okay. Now, if, if you're meditating and you're it's such an all-encompassing problem of being paralyzed, I mean... That, is that a different meditation than if you had a relatively minor injury that you were meditating on, you know, like a broken finger that you wanted to repair? RJ, I would guess meditation is meditation, isn't it? Yeah, it makes no difference. Uh, and in fact, when people work with me, they like to give me their litany of things that's wrong with them. And I always say, don't bother telling me it doesn't matter. So it, it doesn't matter. When, when you meditate properly and you bring energy, higher frequency energy, to whatever area of your body that's in disharmony, higher frequency energy harmonizes lower frequency energy. So it really doesn't matter what the issue is. Obviously, I had a, an extreme, uh, I gave myself an extreme challenge, but meditation, as George said, meditation is meditation. You, you just want to harness your energy properly into one specific direction. And if you're bringing all of your energy into one thing that has a much greater chance of manifesting itself into reality. He also he also wanted to know if you can meditate for somebody else. Uh, well, you can't meditate for someone else, but if he's referring to healing, sending healing energy, ab- absolutely. I mean, sure. That's that's what I do, you know, all the time. So yes, we can send energy to people, to places, to things. We can we can send en- everything is energy. Everything is connected. So, yes, you can send healing energy. I do that all the time. But can you meditate for someone? No. That's the, the, the self is meditation, and someone has to do that through their own volition. And what about things like painting and stuff? Does that help for meditation? Yeah, anything that gets you out of the finite human mind. A- anything, whether you're painting, drumming, uh, dancing, gardening, cooking, it, ma- it makes no difference. When you're not thinking, playing sports, when you're not thinking, that's a state of meditation. That's, that's what uh, people call the no-mind state. So as long as you're not in a thought process, 
you're actually in a state of meditation or what sometimes people call flow. And that's really our natural state. And when we start to attune ourselves to our natural state, sickness and disease actually fall by the wayside. Let's go west of the Rockies. Carol's with us in Big Old Flat, California. Hi, Carol. Welcome. Hi, George. Thanks for taking my call. Ask your, your guest if he can cure macular degenerates because I'm going blind. Well, we don't use the cure word here on the program, but uh, can you help someone who's going blind, RJ? Uh, you can. Energy helps anything. It doesn't matter what the situation is. Uh, you know, my spine was crushed. It was impossible, right? Well, you know, now I go jogging. So energy can help any situation. So it doesn't matter what it is. And the more energy and the higher frequency the energy that you bring, the greater the alchemical reaction that occurs. It's transmutation. So, yes, energy can help any other energy. When you bring high-frequency energy and you harness it, it changes the dynamic of what is going on. We take text and tweets. Tom, what do you have for RJ? Well, this one from Salazar in Rhode Island. Please ask the guest to talk about overcoming a heartbreak such as in a relationship gone bad. Well, that's interesting. That's an interesting question. Can you meditate on a relationship, RJ? Yeah, yeah, yeah you can. So what, what that really is is that people are experiencing um, the attachments. So when we become attached to someone, and, you know, obviously through relationships we end up getting attached, unless we're completely detached, and we can still have a wonderful relationship being completely detached, and I, and I highly recommend it. But when we suffer heart, heartache and heartbreak, and I understand, that's because your energy is attached to someone and you're not getting the feedback that you normally used to get back. So it's kind of like a tennis match. You send energy to that person, and that person sends energy back to you. And so there's this feedback loop, and that's what an attachment is. So right now, you're suffering the – you're not getting the feedback that, you're normally, that you normally did. And so because you're not getting it, it's registering as lack or pain or heartache. So one of the things that you can do is if you can sort of imagine in your mind's eye, just see that, that you're attached to this person with like – cords, electrical cords or strings or rope, it, do, it doesn't matter. But just give yourself an image where you see yourself that you're attached to this person. Then what I want you to do is I want you to release the cords, almost like if you were holding balloons on a string and you just let go of the strings and the balloons just floated away. You simply need to see yourself detaching your connections. And see it visually and then imagine what that feels like to be able to let the balloons go, to be able to let those cords of attachment sever and let them literally just fall to the ground. And when you, when you do that, that feedback loop stops. And we can do this for attachment to people, attachment to beliefs, attachment to concepts, attachment to anything. Remember, attachment is your energy. It is your energy. So you have to reclaim your energy by letting go or severing the attachment. Let's go to first-time caller Stan in Vermilion, South Dakota. Welcome to the show, Stanley. Uh, yeah, say thanks for uh, taking my call. And, sure uh, I just woke up <laughs> okay. and, the, and called about a half hour ago. But uh, for three years, I'm a Vietnam veteran. Thank you for serving. And I suffered a traumatic brain injury in 1969, and uh, my life was miserable real miserable for about eight years. And uh, there's this fellow he's passed on now. His name was Roy Masters. Oh, yeah. We knew Roy. Yeah. yeah. And Roy helped me a lot through meditation. But uh, see, lately I, I found out that veterans are taking their lives a uh, real high rate. And I did three years of research and trying to find out why. And I finally made some headway into it, and it has to do with the lower brain or the limbic system hijacking the higher consciousness. And I was wondering if there's any way R.J. could help these poor veterans to get back their reclaim their lives. It's severe PTSD, R.J. What do you think? Yeah, this I, I've wor I've worked with people with uh, severe PTSD, and it, it it has to do similar to what I was just describing about releasing. So these identifications 
actually let me let me put it this way imagine our body of energy okay and we do have a body of energy our five senses just don't perceive it but i promise you it exists we have a body of energy and imagine your bedspread and when you drop like a quarter or a marble on your bedspread it leaves an indentation okay so these traumatic events leave indentations within our body of energy which then eventually make their way into our physical body so to speak so what we have to do is be able to release these things and this is what therapy is supposed to do and etc cetera, etc cetera. but when we start to do this with our conscious mind and with our force of intention we can make and do this by leaps and bounds that would take years and years and years and years and years of therapy or years and years and years and years of meditation but when you actually use your conscious mind directly properly we can do this quickly so anyone that is suffering from PTSD in any way just realize that these are just indentations within the body of energy that we have identified with and they can be released just like you would take a quarter or a marble off the bedspread it's the same it's the same it works in the same way but you have to let them go and realize that you're the awareness of these things not these things you are simply aware of the the awareness of the traumatic event you're not the traumatic event and by letting them go see them see them in your mind's eye as if they're being released this is really the key see it and then imagine what it feels like to release it it's those two things and then there's two other things to do i don't have time to get into that right now but if you if you can merge the mental image and the tangible feeling at the same time and then actually if you want to include verbalization that you are releasing these things this even increases the multiplier effect of the effectiveness so see it being released imagine what it feels like to release it and then give yourself a mantra or command that you are actually releasing these identifications that you are releasing these traumatic events when you combine these things i call this activating your full healing intention because there's four things that a human being does it's mental emotional verbal and physical those are the four rudiment, rudimentary expressions a human being has if you combine all four of those things and you direct them towards your healing the efficacy is incredible so use for now because i don't have time to get into the, the what to do physically with these things but this is what i had to do with my body give give yourself the mental image remember what it feels like to let go of it and give yourself a command that you are literally releasing these traumatic events and when you say it mean it don't just say it like you're reading off a shopping list say it with complete con conviction and devotion and the more that you combine these things the more you will bring it into reality RJ, can you take emails through your website? Yes, of course. My email, oddly enough, is, is rj at ascendthefrequencies.com. Great. Right through his website. RJ, thanks for being on the program. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you, George. Thanks for having me, and likewise. What a great guy. And uh, first-time guest, and uh, he did just a superb, superb job. And uh, our, we've got programs for you all week long, including live on Thanksgiving night. For Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Ladasour, Ryan Stacy, Stephanie Smith, Chris Boros, Tim Banal, Ian Punnett, and George Knapp. I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.